the one word project is an initiative to examine a diverse set of inputs and perspectives regarding the introduction and evolution of technology as part of elections. We began in uh, May 2021, but back then we used to only focus on blockchains. Uh, now we've broadened out. Uh, the project works with stakeholders in the electoral process to understand, present, and discuss knowledge from various domains, uh, media communications, disability rights, citizen rights, technology designs, and constitutional powers. Uh, One Vote is hosted at HasGeek, and HasGeek is a platform for collaboration across practices surrounding technology design, law, policy, systems, data, and related topics. So the collaborations take place through user-generated content shared by practitioners. So far, we have designed and hosted public deliberations looking at activities like voter verification technologies, elect electoral role deduplication, and the various uh, internet-based voting uh, options. We've also uh, written an interim report and just finished up our first edition of an annual conference. Uh, what we aim to do here is to enable participants of these sessions to acquire the foundational knowledge and perspectives that are required to evaluate the intended and unintended consequences of technology intervention. And we want to ha have a perspectives of identity, equity, privacy, security, rights, agency, and look at the socioeconomic impact of such proposals. Uh, this particular series is being done in collaboration with the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. Um, about audience questions, if you wish to speak, uh, please use the raise hand function and you'll be called upon. Or you can put your questions in the chat. If you're joining us from the YouTube live stream, uh, we'd be monitoring that chat as well. We welcome Roshan Kishore and Govind Etiraj. Now I will hand this over to Professor Bharacharji. Thanks, Chantal. And, um... Hello and welcome to uh, another edition of Fight for Democracy Elections 2022, um, an effort to raise and discuss some critical questions uh, around uh, one of the most important elections, many would say, but all elections are important, actually. I mean, you know, this is what we say each year before elections, that this is the most important election. And I was going through, um, you know, I, I, I worked uh, in an organization where we dealt mostly with numbers. Um, and that was uh, NDTV, my boss for 20 years, Pranoy Roy, who, was, who introduced Sophology in a way in his uh, latest edition of his book. He starts the book by saying, democracy lies at the very core of every Indian's DNA. It is intrinsic to our consciousness. It animates our conversations, energizes our minds, and brings out the best and occasionally the worst in us. The more deprived we are, the poorer we are, the more alienated we are, the more we participate and are protective of our country's elections and democracy. And towards the end of the book, one of his last chapters, actually, he says, the source of all problems is India's poor data. Uh, joining us today, uh, Govind Raj Athiraj, the founder of India Spend, India's first data portal, Boom Live. Um, again, one misinformation portal. Uh, in many ways, uh, Govind really uh, saw um, the criticality of data journalism and ushered this in our country way, way before other newsrooms uh, really were exploring. And Roshan Kishore, an economist uh, who, is, who heads the data uh, in department in Hindustan Times. So two journalists, Govind, with many, many years of uh, television and print journalism experience. Uh, I want to start with you, Govind. If you can quickly tell us or give us a landscape of data journalism. I know data journalism has become the season's favorite. But what exactly is, I mean, we had data early also. It's not like data has emerged just today or just yesterday. What, what has been the genesis of data journalism in India, its growth, presence, and where do you see it moving? Right. So, uh, Kishle, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me uh, into this discussion. Uh, I think uh, 
uh, your question somehow uh, uh, implicitly presupposes uh, the fact that data journalism is you know well present practiced delivered uh, actually we are in a very early stage of the journey so in a way uh, this conversation itself is part of that early stage of the journey you know as as you have conversations uh, you know more people begin to understand including ourselves i mean we may have set down this path but i don't think we are any closer to being uh, experts or any authorities on the subject but you know so when we started india india spend i mean the whole objective was to firstly improve the quality of public discourse and that and we started from there we said okay how do we improve the quality of uh, public discourse we can do that by using data to tell stories and uh, the 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 optimistic view is that if you use data and evidence to tell stories then hopefully the quality of discourse will be better and therefore the electorate will be better informed and therefore will be in a position to make those uh, who are in uh, power uh, uh, in you know accountable and and move and if eventually there will be better governance now this is depending on where you sit or stand this is either utopia or at least the journey towards uh, uh, utopia of which data is a critical part now the the big challenge uh, in when it comes to data is uh, obviously the the communication of it now there are two kinds of audiences there are those who understand and appreciate exactly the role of data mostly in public policy academia and so on uh, this audience for example and there are others who perhaps uh, are not able to grasp it not because they uh, they don't understand but because it's outside the realm of uh, 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 daily life and to that extent it's really uh, let's say the the challenges upon those of us who work on data sets or who write stories around data sets to convey the challenges or convey the proposition that we are trying to convey so in that sense uh, if i were to be a little uh, blunt we failed uh, or we've still not succeeded let me look at it the other way around so i think the uh, now let me give you a couple of examples and uh, and and this is really from uh, stories that we've done and you know you talked about elections we are all looking at uttar uh, uttar pradesh uh, elections that are coming up you know in 2017 we had done a story uh, where we uh, leaned on a poll done by fourth line or a survey and we said because that was an issue we were covering very closely we were looking at air quality uh, very closely so we asked people does air quality matter to you uh, and i'll come to the the definitional part in a moment so some 46% of urban voters and 26% of rural voters uh, in up before election said that the air they breathe is polluted so they they acknowledged that this was a problem but on the other hand this was not an issue that the political parties want to ad- wanted to address nor did it even uh, come up anywhere in the scheme of things from the the political parties point of view so second when asked to choose between reliable power clean water and clean air okay now clean air and again i'm going to come back to that definitional part in a moment uh, 40% of voters said reliable electricity was most important uh, 28% said uh, clean water and 16% uh, said uh, air quality now what is the definitional issue here which makes it interesting right so elections are fought on broadly let's say tangible issues and intangible issues in this case air quality is a very tangible issue because you are literally seeing it and breathing it now maybe because you're seeing it and breathing it or not breathing all the time it becomes uh, it becomes invisible but the fact is that it could, you could not get more uh, let's say uh, tangible than this as opposed to many of the intangible issues on which people vote so therefore that itself gives you an indicator of how uh, people vote now let me give you another example uh, uh, malnutrition uh, is is an issue in india now now malnutrition as compared to air quality is not as tangible uh, it it comes later but nevertheless uh, we we looked at a study for example uh, in done i think uh, just let me give you i'm trying to pull out the exact yeah so this study uh, looked at analysis uh, looked at 70 i mean looked at 543 parliamentary constituencies but said that 72 of those constituencies uh, were in the top 2 quintiles that 20% of prevalence of child malnutrition uh, of these 12 const- uh, 12 constituencies were in jharkhand 19 in madhya pradesh 10 in karnataka 8 in up and 6 in uh, rajasthan now uh, this particular study which was uh, run by harvard did not get into what political uh, leanings were or electoral preferences were but i think it's safe to say that there was almost no connect between let's say health outcomes at this level which is very very fundamental uh, malnutrition and stunting and uh, what eventually happened in the election 
let me give you one more uh, quick example and then i'm going to uh, uh, pause uh, in 2018, uh, Niti Aayog, uh, which is under the current government, uh, put out something called a Health Index Initiative. It was uh, it provided disaggregated scores and rankings to Indian states and union territories according to their health sector performance. Now, in this, uh, Kerala, uh, Punjab, uh, Tamil Nadu ranked on top in terms of overall performance. Okay, health sector performance of Indian states. Uh, UP, Rajasthan, and Bihar fared the worst. Okay, so UP is done by BJP, Rajasthan Congress, Bihar is uh, BJP plus. So, and then there were small states and uh, then there were some other interesting patterns uh, between, let's say, Kerala, Punjab, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, uh, neonatal mortality uh, and, and and their overall sort of performance in uh, this thing. Now, uh, could there be, let's say, greater uh, electoral or uh, informed voter choice? Uh, possibly but uh, it's highly unlikely and there are unfortunately also which is the other problem there are not enough studies to look at uh, this issue so deeply as to understand why did voters vote in a certain way uh, and more importantly did any of these aspects have any uh, play in the way they voted right so we know all the obvious reasons or likely obvious reasons but did any of this have a role in it we don't have a clear idea i mean there are some studies but it's it's not clear so and, and you have to remember that finally, uh, as we speak today, there is a haze of misinformation, which, which, which sits on all of this. Right? So the haze also causes further distortion in the way people view uh, what are, uh, let's say, physical outcomes in terms of policies and, and so on. So even if something is not working, uh, again, al along the issues that I spoke of, uh, could be to do with uh, water, could be to do with electricity, could be to do with clean air, uh, health access. Uh, there could be a haze of misinformation which typically twists uh, people's perceptions of what the real source of the problem is or takes them into a completely different thought zone uh, and thus influences the outcome of uh, elections. So I think as, as we look forward and, and uh, I will pause after this is there are two or three issues. I think data is available. Uh, there are people now increasingly who look at data and tell stories. Uh, the challenge, I think, continues to be how do you ensure that these stories reach more and more people in a way that it affects their uh, uh, or influences their thinking in a positive way, I mean, and is able to influence the way they take their electoral decisions about who they elect and why they elect them. Uh, India's fundamental or foundational issues are health, education uh, and environment. Right. I could add gender, but gender, uh, let me maybe in some ways subsumes all of this. So health, education, environment and gender. These are the four areas that we at India spend cover as well. If we are if we want people to elect those they elect on the basis of uh, performance on in these four areas, data should be an important input. The challenge, therefore, now is to say, how do we convey that data in a manner that people make the most useful or efficient uh, electoral decisions? I'm going to pause there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Govind, for laying the land, uh, as it were. Um, Roshan, I'm sure you would like to respond to a uh, number of uh, issues that Govind has raised. But essentially, uh, what I understand is that, you know, in a democracy, the electorate should be well informed. And today we are assuming that with data, the electorate is going to be better informed. But there is a challenge because the data may not be correct. And you know, how do you ensure that the data is good, the data is authentic? And the other thing is that reaching the voters, because a large percentage of the voters will not be English language speaking people. How do you reach them? Because the journalism that we guys do mostly are going to be English language. Is there, are, are, are there language, uh, you know, uh, journalists um, in, in the regions? using data to, 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 to do journalism in various other languages is something that I would like to know. And finally, uh, Roshan, I, you know, you are in the political desk as well at the Hindustan Times. I mean, data driven, let's say. But what does data journalism bring to table when it comes to media coverage of elections in India? I, I'll start with the last question, Kishle. Uh, 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 you know, uh, like you said, when you pointed about uh, the work Dr. Roy has been doing at NDTV. So we have been talking numbers as far as elections are concerned for a very long time in India. There's nothing new about it. And if you know, I were to you know, slightly sort of push the envelope and, and include things such as the Economic and Political Weekly, which is you know, informed journalism at a certain level, then, you know, I mean, CSDS, Lokniti numbers, etc. So those numbers have been around. 
and you know uh, uh, journalistic work around elections i think can be divided into two parts one is what you do when the campaign is on and the other part begins when you try and make sense of the results uh, so you know uh, there i think you know uh, the value which say you know, dedicated data journalism desk can add is you know for example you know 2014 onwards you know politically speaking we have entered a new epoch of sorts in our country where the bjp has been the dominant political party and in 19 it sort, sort of further strengthened that dominance and with the bjp there is a particular narrative in india the bjp has been a party of the hindu right and you know i mean people largely say that the bjp's victories actually mean that you know that sort of an ideology a hindu right exclus exclusionary ideology has been gaining ground in india i am not saying that is not true Uh, but one thing which data if you look at it carefully not just during elections but over time in a continuum actually tells you is that the reality could be a bit more complicated than that i'll give you one example you know, look at assembly election results and national election results after 2014 uh, almost all national elections at the state level the bjp seems to enjoy a vote a vote premium you know delhi is the best example the city where i work in you know the aap actually finished third in the 19 lok sabha elections it it won the state with a very overwhelming majority before the 19 lok sabha elections and it did so even after the lok sabha elections uh, so it does tell at that you know voters actually make very informed choices if you look at the voting pattern in say odisha in 20, 2019 you know the same voter going to the same polling booth actually seems to have voted for two different political parties at the bjd at the state level and the bjp at the national level uh, so no i am not for a second undermining the importance and no and i think the i'm misinformation has always been an integral part of political tactics i think through centuries not just in modern democracy but the advent of internet and the whatsapp ecosystem you know today i think if we were to be honest enough we could all actually question as to how much control does journalism mainstream new age journalism actually has on narrative setting because every political party to the best of its ability i think is trying very hard to set up its own parallel narratives the bjp whatsapp ecosystem will have a different sort of a narrative you know the the opposition ecosystem will have a different sort of a narrative and this is not something which uh, we knowing for the first time you know uh, work by political scientists i tried milan vaishnav as an example he works at the carnegie institute these days so his phd looked at the issue of criminality in bihar uh, and his research found out that you know a lot of good work in india political party watchdog such as adr etc they actually very painstakingly comp- you know compile candidate level affidavits and they bring out releases of uh, what kind of criminal cases are pending against candidates what sort of financial backgrounds do they have uh, but milan's research actually found that it is not the fact that people did not know about the criminal antecedents of the candidates before elections uh, their decision to vote or not to vote for them was driven by very different considerations i mean they actually saw criminal candidates as you no know, strong candidates are could potentially help them so i think there if we look carefully at the data uh, first thing which it tells us uh, or you no know, uh, tells us to be very you know uh, cautionary about is we should not jump to simple judgments in a country as diverse as india as big as india uh, political results could actually be a result of lot more factors than we think they are uh, that's my first thing you know uh, we can talk about it later as we go on but if you have somebody looking carefully at the data Uh, there's some nuance which you get in your coverage. Thanks, uh, Gobind. You know, you mentioned uh, you've given us number uh, some few examples, and uh, I know that you all cover health, environment, gender, uh, employment. I think these are the four areas which, yeah, which, which you which you, uh, for example, healthcare access, which is which is so important. Or, and gained so much of currency over the last uh, two years now if you can give us you know one or two examples of uh, data driven exploration um, in social justice or rights issues which highlights topics that are not discussed uh, during campaigns i mean i know that most of the critical issues are not discussed during campaigns but something that you feel that you all have done and can push then the conversation the disc- like because you said that it improves the quality of public discourse no uh, yeah i mean i what i'm saying is that our uh, mission is to improve the quality of public discourse now to what extent we are succeeding uh, i don't know i think 
yes, it is a fact that there are many, many uh, data inputs into the sort of melting pot of uh, uh, consciousness, as it were. But is it uh, is it doing anything, or how much it is doing, or do people vote intuitively uh, in a different way? I think the, the uh, what people intuitively vote for, we know. Uh, whether they vote for things that we believe are important from a fundamental uh, point of view, and when I say fundamental, I mean health, education, and uh, 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 environment. I, I'm not sure, and uh, I think I think that the evidence usually kind of in a post facto way indicates that uh, there really is really is no connection uh, between many of these things, uh, or. Even if there is a change in uh, political leadership, uh, the political leadership itself does not do anything to really change uh, matters on ground. And I think that's really the story of India in some ways uh, over the decades. So let me give you an example of where, uh, you know, where we think we've had an impact. And maybe I don't think it's so much of so, so much social justice uh, in the way you put it, uh, Kishle, but uh, at least uh, uh, it, I would say awareness about uh, equity uh, and, uh, and and it really comes back to uh, the air we breathe. So about four years ago, we uh, we ran a project called Breathe. It was called Hashtag Breathe. And what we did was we uh, basically, uh, I mean, the, the first thing was to try and uh, establish whether we had data on air quality in this country. And the, the answer was there wasn't. And the little data that there was was actually offline and it lay with uh, people like Delhi Pollution Control Board or Central Pollution Control Board or whichever state uh, the, it might, uh, the state might be. But we were obviously looking at Delhi because Delhi was uh, already at that point uh, as it continues to be amongst the most polluted cities in the world. Now, uh, and as we tried to find uh, more data, we found, I mean, there wasn't enough data. Uh, nor was the data available real time and uh, so on a normal on a morning if you were to get up and say okay what is the air around me like you had no way of measuring now this is before uh, the advent of uh, all those uh, you know, sort of more expensive uh, air purifiers which come with built-in air quality monitors and which I'm sure all of you who are here from Delhi on this panel will have uh, but in Bombay so far uh, we've survived without uh, but uh, so we what we did was we uh, built our own monitoring stations using low cost sensors and built a complete uh, 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 built a device which was actually transmitting real time air quality data both PM 2.5 PM 10 and uh, temperature and we had a dashboard it was uh, on breathe.indiaspan.com where you could actually see it live. So you could actually uh, go to Delhi and there were other cities as well and zoom in and you could see what the air quality at that point was or literally five minutes ago in Vasant Kunj uh, versus uh, Dwarka versus Jandewala extension uh, versus uh, Noida. And uh, one reason it was Noida was because quite a few TV channels started putting our device on, uh, on, on the top of their uh, rooftops and measuring it and then playing it back. So uh, I think what the thing that happened after that, you know, till then uh, air quality was an issue, but it was an invisible issue. I mean, it was literally enveloping everyone and yet people were not uh, uh, completely aware of the damage that it was doing. Uh, except that you knew it because maybe children were uh, coughing more or uh, needed nebulizers and so on. Uh, I think what happened in that period, I'm talking about 16, 17, uh, 2016, 17 towards 18, is that uh, the awareness of the issue, thanks to data, went up dramatically, for which we can claim uh, some small credit. Obviously, we uh, put all our effort into Delhi because we knew that was where uh, uh, the pollution was uh, most, and people were also likely to notice uh, the data, I mean. And uh, post which, I think, if you as you fast forward, I mean, the government, had, it, the government had just started doing so, but it then expanded its own uh, suffer network for uh, air quality monitoring. I mean, one of our problems with that, the government's network was that their monitoring stations were in very public places, for example, uh, traffic signals and uh, junctions. And we felt that, you know, you don't stay usually right uh, next to a traffic junction or a signal or whatever. You're normally a little inside. So uh, readings can get distorted. I mean, you can have much higher readings than uh, what you would uh, usually be experiencing, let's say in a colony in Delhi or whatever. So, I mean, be that as it may, I think uh, uh, we managed to bring this out. We also did a whole lot of other things on the social side. We worked with uh, Twitter and, you know, you could just say hashtag breathe Vasant Kunch and you would, uh, uh, that it, the data would get pulled from the cloud and then it would flash on your Twitter timeline. So I think net net, uh, as we went towards to 2018 and uh, like I said, not only because of us, uh, the, the 
concept of data when it came to air quality became a page one uh, or rather data became a page one data point right so earlier uh, on page one or whether it's hindustan times or whatever uh, 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 or you know it would always be weather and maybe rainfall uh, like in in uh, bombay mumbai where i am rainfall is a big obviously something you watch carefully uh, in the monsoons uh, but air quality has come there now this uh, may or may not lead to uh, the uh, let's say equal effort on the policy execution side because the policy response i think uh, did has started coming around but has there been sufficient response in the policy execution perhaps not uh, but clearly everyone is aware of the issue everyone is now deep dive has deep driven into you know where is the pollution coming from the breakdown of pollution is it coming is it being imported from states outside delhi is it because of construction dust is it because of chullas it could something else so i think people are now aware and uh, uh, and i guess the role that people like us play is uh, is to say that okay how do you make people aware then after which they can take their own decisions on what they want to do so i think this is what perhaps the best use case i have in terms of sheer popularity and impact of where uh, data that affected or uh, had an impact on public life uh became i mean we we managed to cross the across the boundaries uh and you know penetrate uh, or the barriers rather uh, and penetrate people's consciousness uh i, I mean like i said it it's happened uh, along the way uh, uh, maybe with other people as well uh hindustan times also did uh, i don't know if roshan you were there at that time but hindustan times was also trying to uh, was also trying to do a similar effort in air quality uh and i think they started uh, almost at the same time but uh, we were building our own devices so we could move faster uh but to the credit of uh, the hindustan times editor at that time i think it was nick dodge uh they uh, i think they also felt that this was something that they wanted to focus on and hindustan times similarly has been uh, a, a pioneer in attempting many such data projects uh which i will of course leave to roshan to speak about not uh, uh, but i i think so the challenge therefore is how do you uh, you know take issues that are important find the right combination of technology and visualization that will help people understand and grasp it the most e- in the most easiest way this is i mean sometimes it's a it it comes together i mean like it did in this case uh, because i met some environmentalist from brazil who was doing similar work in uh, the amazon river in trying to measure and display uh, and some others in the united states who were doing some other work but not in equality uh but i think the the challenge and the opportunity is to really find that uh, uh, happy confluence point where you can really show uh, what is happening in a way that people understand it and then and also in in a way that it impacts them you know when you say aqi is uh, yesterday was 300 and today is 900 then you say wow what's going on here you know and uh, maybe you'll do something about it or maybe you will uh, you know uh, you will press or push your elected representatives to do something about it or like as we discovered in our own readings at that time or we would say something as simple as uh, don't take a walk at 7 am in the morning because that uh, that's the time uh, the air in central delhi is the most polluted right if you do want to take a walk then do it at 12 pm in the afternoon because that's when uh, let's say the quality of air quality improves uh, the other fact like or another factor saying that uh, air quality is linked to wind speeds and we started showing wind speeds as well by the way because you could just by a simple api just pull it from uh, i think from google or somewhere so uh, if wind speeds are good then air uh, the air clears up right so you are also watching wind speeds so you say okay nothing's going to happen on air quality but if the wind speeds uh, pick up then i'm sure we'll have a nice day ahead of us so of course this gets into a bit of a geek territory but it's something that you can uh, experience and uh, uh, see for yourself Uh, and need not be dependent on uh, some data geek sitting in india spend or wherever they are that's why that's why this uh, this platform is called has geek so i suppose you know they were the geeks who are uh, monitoring this but uh, govin the question that i asked uh, roshan is that you know that considering that majority of indians and the indian electorate are not watching us because this is not the language Uh, of the indian electorate uh, nor would they be reading india spend or hindustan times uh, how do you convey what you are trying to convey to the rest of the people so th- i mean there is a big challenge on that front but uh, i mean i think all of us are making our own efforts i mean you know india spend is also in hindi and tamil by the way so it's not like we're only in in, in english 
yeah, a lot of people do read us in hindi but will they read stuff like this are you know we have two kinds of audiences one audience is obviously the public policy audience uh, whether it's within government or outside academia and so on the other audience is really uh, our publishing uh, those who read our articles via our publishing article uh, publishing partners so people read our articles because they may appear on first post or scroll or, or hindustan i mean not hindustan times uh, business standard uh, dow jones news wires and so on so we have a much larger audience than our uh, portal as you said i mean we prefer to call it a website but uh, uh, but it's it's a much larger audience but yes that audience is not the audience that if you are saying that up is going to go into elections and there are 200 million uh, or not 200 million people will not vote but let's say 150 million people will vote or I, i don't know whatever the exact number is but they are not going to be reading all of this i think therefore it goes back to the original challenge of saying that how do we how do we really take that data those data points and convey them in a manner that that at least several million people will understand as opposed to the few hundred thousand or a couple of million that do today so i'll have to i can only unfortunately answer till that point all right thanks uh, roshan uh, you know we are talking about up and i'm going to come to the uh, to my favorite question a little later uh, which with reference to up but you know as data you know pushes indian political campaigns uh, more and more the political parties are using data journalist uh, newsrooms are using data and you know with reference to up i'm saying is there also the risk that it drags uh, divisive caste politics with it because now we know how many say for example in an entire booth if x percentage of people have voted uh, the political parties actually can find out who have voted for them and who have voted not voted for them is so it's it, it is it's a danger right in some way and then they get disenfranchised i mean in the next elections we've seen we've had this example where an entire pocket of voters who did not vote for a particular party was were disenfranchised forever you know uh, uh, i think there are two ways to look at it kishle uh, uh, you know the indian society as we know it has always been divided uh, on various lines in this caste this religion and all that you know uh, at some point of time class also used to be a big thing you know because there were conflicts between the haves and the have nots uh, Uh, and these problems were there earlier also i mean if you remember you know when we used to do elections via ball- paper ballots you know the election commission actually introduced the pra- practice of mixing ballots for different booths at a very later stage so earlier you actually you know and that is when the results started getting delayed because I, they would actually mix ballots so, so earlier also there was the possibility of political parties finding out which booth did they get how many votes etc what data and technology especially has done here is is that it has allowed political parties to scale things on a completely unimaginable level you know to come back to the question which you asked govind uh, uh, so the kind of data you know which we try and bring out in our work and the kind of journalism which we would like to see and believe you know uh, people follow during the elections i think political parties are actually running a completely parallel network to that uh, almost all major political parties in india now hire political consultants uh, they do their own political surveys mm-hmm. i mean i think the richer ones probably do rounds and rounds of surveys before elections right from candidate selection to what issue you know all of us heard about you know how you know ipac sort of helped mamta banerjee with the duare sarkar thing and all that and it's just one example like every political party does it so and you know there is reason to believe you know of course we will not have substantive proof of it that political parties especially the ones which have been in government have access to a lot of sensitive data you know privacy concerns etc we know how seriously they are uh, followed or not followed in india and we have been hearing reports of welfare beneficiaries being approached you know, specifically and in a targeted manner by political parties etc so their data has sort of actually tilted the scales in a big way in favor of political parties who are either in power or have a lot of monetary resources to hire those kind of people uh, that's one uh coming back to the the question of you know data allowing i think you know divisiveness yes i think that threat exists uh technology has allowed that threat to be scaled at a different level uh but i also think that you know it is ultimately the choice of the political party of the day i mean if a political party wants it can do a survey you know on whether you know say improving the quality of government schools will let lead to more tailwinds or traction for it in say poor localities i mean if it wants it can actually serve a middle class localities where in electricity bill rebate etc can matter and of course i mean you can do it for all sorts of divisive purposes also 
so I don't think data has actually sort of brought something new which did not exist in the Indian political system or the electoral ecosystem earlier. What it has actually you know, allowed political parties to do is scale things on a completely different level. So that way, yes, you know, the positive or the negative spin-offs of it would be far greater than what they used to be, say, 20, 30 years ago. Sorry. Um, Govind, what would be the drawbacks, you know, with the relentless news cycle that uh, create for data-driven investigative stories? You know, the this 24-7 news uh, creates a time crunch. <clears throat> so your stories or your topics remain alive only for a few hours or for a day. And uh, that's, a ch that's a challenge, isn't it, to hold readers' attention? Because you spend a considerable amount of time, you know, doing these kind of investigations. Uh, yeah, I think, Kishle, we are not part of that race. So, and we've not, never, we've not been part of that race uh, for a while. So we don't feel it. Uh, you know, I mean, if I, maybe I as a consumer might be affected by, uh, you know, 72 hour news cycles and so on. But as a producer uh, uh, or uh, in our own little way, are not affected by this at all. I mean, the, the whole idea of starting uh, uh, this venture was to, uh, you know, uh, free ourselves from this cycle, do one story a day, spend anywhere between two weeks and two months doing stories, works on projects like the air quality one I just described and many other projects which take months, uh, sometimes a year to fruition in, in the way we want it. Uh, and we've continued to do that. I mean, uh, more. I mean, I guess the consumption of uh, such uh, uh, material has only increased. And I think the, uh, and, and we do see that, you know, when we do something interesting or as others do something interesting, the transmission does take place. You know, the, the data is only building the argument on the back end, if you want to, if, if I may use that term. Um, on the front end, it's really the story that you see. Uh, you know, if you're, if you know, if I can convince you that I've done all this data crunching it back to present an argument to you that this is what the real picture is when it comes to, let's say, healthcare delivery or education or people's uh, uh, opinion about a certain issue. Uh, I mean, which is more survey based, uh, then you will believe me, or the chances are that you will believe me because you trust the work that I've done on the back end. Now, you don't have to understand what I have done at the back end necessarily. You don't have to know that, uh, you know, that here, I mean, know every line on what my of my Excel sheet uh, and and believe it and uh, parse through it. So, so I think the, 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 the consumption of our, what we say or what we've uh, uh, transmitted, uh, uh, created and transmitted in the last many years has definitely increased. I mean, if indirectly, if not uh, uh, directly. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, that the the journey is still a long way to go because if we look at uh, the population as a whole or uh, the, the overall uh, let's say electoral uh, base of this country and because I mean your your the theme of your uh, discussion is fight for democracy, uh, then we have a long way to go uh, where people take decisions basis data and evidence uh, and also I mean you may just like a vote you may just vote for someone because you like that person's face uh, or what that person says and that's fine uh, all we are saying is that to the extent that you can or if you could then also use data and evidence which people like us are working on so that your choices are informed whatever they may be mm -hmm. Roshan, are, are there any recent examples of uh, you know false narratives now false narratives is a very uh, you know one can co contest that term itself that has been created using data journalism? You're asking me to criticize one of our own. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it, it, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a huge risk, right? When you, uh, when you say that, oh, these are the numbers. And I'm, because as a layman, I don't know where the numbers you're getting from. No, but the numbers no I think it's an important question, Kisle. Uh, see, I would not attribute motives to people because ultimately, you know, especially, you know, our peers in, in the profession, I, mean, I would rather not do that. Uh, but it is uh, eminently possible that two people would come to very different conclusions based on the same data. And I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, for example, you know, in India, you know, I mean, almost everybody agrees that there's a problem in agriculture. Uh, the, the real debate is what is the problem and therefore what is the solution to it? A lot of people, including very senior journalists, argue that India actually has a problem of oversupply in agriculture. You know, that we, you know, we had our share of, you know, problems, you know, uh, you no know, a supply constraint before the green revolution started and we would have to import food grains now we actually have like every year we do a surplus and you know, every year you have a record breaking food grain production 
Therefore, a lot of people say that actually there's a problem of oversupply in agriculture. Uh, now, if you were to accept that diagnosis of the problem in Indian agriculture, you know, logically, forget everything, what I mean, that person or that argument is saying is that you actually have to target negative growth rates in agriculture. Because you know, if you have a problem of oversupply, then why do you want to increase production further? Now, that's quite bizarre. I mean, of course, people who make these arguments stop short of saying so. But then you have to look at you know, other parts of the problem. You know, and I personally have been arguing this for a long time, that you know, the problem is not oversupply. The problem is that a lot of, an overwhelming majority of Indians actually do not have enough to eat in this country. And, and the fact that the government has been distributing free food grains to around 800 million people, you know, the government has been saying this continuously, that they've been giving five kilograms of food grains to around 80 crore people in this country after the pandemic, is the biggest proof of that, that you know, people's incomes and purchasing powers are so volatile that they can't even, so low actually, that they can't even buy five kg of wheat and rice after the pandemic. And you know, anybody who goes on the field, etc., will, will, will be able to clearly say that a large number of the poor actually do not eat what a respectable person would call a diet. So you know, this is a good example of how on the basis of same data, or I would say on the basis of looking at selective data, you can actually reach at very wrong conclusions. Uh, so of course, and this is something which, you know, the last time you had me in the, in, in the journalism talk, I made this, that it is very important to have domain knowledge and knowledge of the context of the data which you're talking about. Uh, otherwise you can actually, I mean, it is completely not surprising that you would reach wrong conclusions. Yeah. And Roshan, what is the data telling us about the coming elections? Well, that, you know, uh, it's very difficult because a lot of poll surveys happen. Uh, uh, unfortunately, most journalists do not have access to that real-time data. Not that they have a very good track record per se, you know, but, but at least, you know, the only pollsters who have been making their data transparently available for research and academic purposes have been the CSDS Lokniti people. Uh, we also have to understand that they ultimately are a quasi-academic institute. You know, they do partnerships and all that with some media organizations to sort of fund the thing. But we, you actually have a lot more you know, people in the game now who are actually who actually do this for purely commercial motives. So, you know, for example, somebody like Axis, you know, who has had a reasonable track record in predicting elections, this is not their bread and butter. The bread and butter is actually proper polling. You know, they do it for business houses, corporates, etc. So, if somebody has you know, access to significantly large resources, you know, I mean, basic thing in statistics is you know, the quality of your sample. I mean, if, if you give me one lakh rupees to do a survey and if you give me 10 crore rupees to do a survey you know my sample is going to be i mean definitely much better than yours so if these polling houses were to transparently share their numbers with journalism i think the public discourse would be rich in india as far as understanding what goes into elections is concerned uh, unfortunately that's not the case that is not something which we as journalists can actually help because you know ultimately those people you know it is between the people who do those surveys and the people who pay them so there, I think we would do a lot more better if we actually had access to that data. Otherwise, you know, it's, I mean, my guess is as good as yours as to what is going to happen in the elections. Yeah. Kishle, can I, I, uh, can I come in on this? You know, yeah. I, I think, but I mean, we should distinguish between uh, surveys and polls yeah. and uh, the quantitative quantitative data that I'm assuming we're talking about otherwise. Uh, yeah. You know, when we talk about health it, outcomes or education outcomes or climate uh, environment, uh, you know, we're talking about quantitative data. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not opinions about, uh, you know, who will I vote for or who do I think is a, a great politician and so on. So, I mean, I mean, when, when you look at large uh, uh, quantums of surveys, I mean, they become data in their own right. Uh, and and rightly so. I mean, these are all. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm assuming uh, scientifically run. Uh, not assuming. I know. I mean, we all know that uh, scientifically run. The standards are global standards on how samples are selected and so on. But they're still surveys. Uh, it's not the same. I mean, I, I think we should make sure that we uh, yeah, yeah. draw a small line of distinction between uh, these two worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's actually, so not a small line. Like, I think it's a big line of difference between, uh, that, between the two things. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Yashan. Uh, no, I yeah. completely agree with Govind there. You know, that I mean, we have tangible statistics. You know, unfortunately, it's becoming the case that we have less and less of those statistics in India today. But when it comes to elections, because we are talking elections, the two need not always sort of you know be congruent with each other. You now, for example, the BJP won Uttar Pradesh after demonetization. That no matter which tangible data you look at, it'll tell you that demonetization led to economic pain. Uh, so uh, there I think what makes elections complicated is that you might not have a correspondence between the tangible and the non-tangible which is political preferences in this case that's my limited point yeah uh, 
Govind, the other thing that I wanted to, I mean, because we don't have a lot of time left and I want uh, to bring in the audience out here. Also, people watching uh, on the YouTube live stream, if you can type your questions in so that we can um, get the questions and ask the speakers. But my personal question, uh, Govind, is that, you know, whenever we talk about, say, for example, if we are, if we referred to elections in today's show, we've referred to Uttar Pradesh uh, at least thrice or four times, and we have not mentioned Manipur and Punjab. Uh, whereas Manipur and Punjab is much easier uh, in terms of uh, discussion through data because they're much smaller states. I mean, you know, so your data is, I mean, Manipur's total population, I mean, look at, would, would, wouldn't be, would, would be a district's population in the UP. And we also know that these smaller states and the borderlands of India are constantly falling off the map. Is there a way to where, which, where data journalism helps to actually bring the, these smaller states and all falling off the map areas, the shadow areas, into mainland discourse? I don't know if data journalism specifically helps, Kishle. I'm, I mean, I'm not able to uh, uh, sort of get my arms around this one. But I, I think, you know, when you use data to tell stories, um, I mean, what you're trying to do is to make the argument more substantive. Uh, you're trying to build a case where uh, in, in, in a, and perhaps sometimes disprove a case, right? You may have a certain belief. Let me give you another example. You know, one of the big uh, uh, statements that emerged after the uh, uh, 2012, and I think there was another ca uh, uh, case in 2014, uh, rapes uh, uh, in, in Delhi. Uh, uh, the first was the famous Nirbhaya case. The second, I think, was uh, it happened in an Uber car. Uh, was that Delhi was the rape capital of the country. Uh, and I think, uh, I remember we started looking, uh, my colleagues started looking at uh, NCRB data, that's National Crime Records Bureau data in 2014 and found that uh, at that point, uh, Delhi was not uh, uh, nowhere, near, not nowhere near, but it was definitely not the top uh, city when it came to uh, a number of rapes uh, in proportion to population. Uh, actually, it was Gwalior. Uh, that was the number one uh, city that year. Now, uh, you could rightfully argue that, you know, maybe cases are underreported in Delhi and overreported in Gwalior and so on. But that's, I mean, but the fact is that the, the primary assertion that Delhi was the rape capital was not the correct one. But that was the popular, uh, uh, if you remember, uh, yeah. and continues to be actually, uh, it continues to be the popular perception. Now, uh, which is, now how does this affect things, right? So when, if you remember again, go back to 2012, and uh, if you remember the public outcry that followed, Everyone said Delhi is a rape capital and we need to have uh, a greater policing uh, or better quality policing. We need to have uh, more women in the police force and so on and so forth. So now when something is driven by perception, uh, your policy outcomes or responses can be a little different than what the right uh, or what the, I mean, your prescription, policy prescription can vary from what maybe the uh, it should be in an ideal situation. For example, you may say that, oh, Delhi is the rape capital and therefore we should have more women in police stations, right? Now, that in itself is a good thing, uh, but maybe you also need to have more women in police stations in Gwalior. Uh, and I think there was another state in Madhya Pradesh, Indore, I think, which was also ranking quite high up. Now, those numbers have shifted subsequently as, you know, overall uh, rape data or crime against women data has shifted uh, as reporting has obviously increased and improved. But the fact is that you're uh, you're tempted to take policy decisions on the basis of uh, uh, perceptions rather than data. So now, if I were to go back to your Manipur question, uh, you know, you've got it. You the the uh, whether we have a specific understanding for Manipur or not, uh, if as long as we are applying these metrics to make policy decisions whether it's Manipur or Delhi or Maharashtra or UP, uh, then I think we are better off. And equally, if a certain perception is building up in public and you can't blame them, then we should counter that as public policy people or uh, and including in government. You know, uh, maybe at that time, no one had the guts in government to go and tell people that, listen, you know, Delhi is not the rape capital because obviously, uh, I mean, you will be uh, booed out uh, uh, and so on. But but the fact is that at some point, uh, those in policy and in government should have tried to draw these distinctions. 
and say, okay, I mean, uh, let's let's uh, attack this problem on the basis of uh, existing data, and now let's build a policy framework to address crime against women, right? The other and the last point on that, as you know, uh, most crime against women, more than 90% of cases, now this is commonly known, okay, even six, seven years ago, it was not commonly known, is uh, the perpetrator is known to the victim or the victim is known to the perpetrator. So now if you say that uh, Delhi is a rape capital and you want to put more uh, women in police stations or you know, have more night patrolling, but if more than 90, 95% of cases, uh, the victim is known to the perpetrator, then aren't you, uh, you know, uh, aren't you trying to solve the wrong problem? Uh, again, not to say that you should not have more patrolling or women in police stations. By the way, this uh, statistic about 90% uh, plus is, uh, is is consistent with many other parts of the world. India is not an uh, exception. So, I mean, just to re-highlight the point that you, you need to have data for any context, whether it's a small geography, like a small state, like you pointed out, a large or a horizontal issue like, like women's rights, like crime against women. And ensure that policy or public policy is informed by that and everyone is aware of that. And we as citizens also play some role in this in terms of asking the right questions or in demanding accountability and so on. So let me stop there. All right. Thanks. Roshan, uh, you know, same question, but if I can put it more because you are on a, you're in the newsroom uh, where would you i mean how much of how much of coverage do you would you do uh, on a state like manipur which is also going to election with upa because i haven't seen any of the newspapers i don't read the hindustan times sorry to confess that uh, morning i mean i just reduced my newspaper and television <laughs> uh, viewing um, but i haven't seen much of uh, manipur or even punjab actually on the newspapers uh, Gisla, I think, uh, to be fair to news organizations, uh, uh, the the proportional, the I mean, the reportage representation which states get is by and large proportional to their importance in the parliamentary arithmetic of the country, which is why you know it's absolutely not surprising that uh, UP gets more, uh, which is why Bengal got more last time. Uh, but to come back to your question, no, I think uh, uh, that most people in this country, and I'm not even talking about you know. Uh, the relatively underprivileged, even people who are under, un, otherwise well versed with, say, the popular discourse or the journalistic discourse in this country, actually know very little about the, the, the political diversity which sort of comes with the regional diversity in our country. They know very little. For example, you know, I'll give you a Manipur example. Irom Shamila contested the elections last time. Uh, you know, if this one person from Manipur, which a lot of people who follow the news in India know, it was Irom Shamila. I mean, they probably know her more than they would know politicians in Manipur. Uh, and her electoral thing was, frankly speaking, quite a disaster. Uh, that tells you something about politics in that state. Uh, when it comes to supporting Irom on issues such as, say, opposing the AFS pass, he actually you know, gets you know, support which is across the political spectrum. It didn't translate into her uh, you know, electoral support. Yeah. That tells you how politics in that state works. I'll give you another example. You know, Kerala is the only state where the communists actually run a government today. You know, if you go via the stereotype play again, you'd actually think that you know Kerala is full of revolutionaries. Uh, if you look at the 2019 results, you know the CPIM and the left suffered huge reverses, and I would like to believe that it was primarily on account of the Sabrimala issue because the LDF government there took a stand supporting entry of women in Sabrimala, which again you would think that is a very progressive thing to do, and therefore will have a lot of traction in Kerala. They actually made an intelligent retreat from the issue thanks to a Supreme Court stay on that thing. So you know, I think and, you know, election results are a very useful data set in themselves. So they actually tell us a lot about how you know, uh, society behaves otherwise and behaves politically. Uh, so this in itself is a very important insight for me. If you, know, if you were to do nothing and just sort of you know, compare the news cycle, rest of the year and the election results, I think you can make some very useful deductive judgments. Thanks. Uh, you know, I'm going to open this uh, for questions. I'll uh, already see a uh, a hand go up, uh, but if I can, before I come to some uh, you, Samyokta, can I uh, request my colleague, uh, Dr. Ruchira Sen, who actually teaches uh, data journalism to our students, uh, because she's been chat typing something out there. Ruchira, I, I can't uh, <laughs> look at the screen and look at the chat, so I, uh, uh, I'm handicapped in that. So if you can put your question. Well, my question is essentially about multitasking, Gishle. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, 
for data journalism since we're teaching it. Uh, there's this uh, book that's come out, Whole Numbers and Half Truths, which I think really covers a lot of issues of data journalism in India. And Rukmani, uh, who's the author, she basically compares household surveys to NCRB data. And she develops this uh, you know, nice uh, two-dimensional metric where she shows states which have high levels of household. I mean, they have reported in household surveys that there is a uh, you know, high incidences of rape but it isn't captured in ncrb data and meanwhile there are you know places that have high reporting but but you know uh, that's also captured i mean uh, you know the household surveys has it less but in the ncrb data it's more so she basically shows that delhi is over reporting whereas there are many other places like bihar which have under reporting so i was asking do you think it's a good idea to develop a culture where we you know we shouldn't comment on uh, data led or data driven ideas without looking at two or more data sources to make any point because one data source might be misleading and also the other question I had was whether there's a role of open government activists and open data activists where journalists can partner with academics and with civil society. And who do you want? Uh, who are you throwing this question to? Oh, <laughs> to both, to both, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, yeah, Yes, yeah. Go in. Yeah, go. yeah, yeah, okay. So I think the, sec uh, the answer to the second one is yes. And I think we are already uh, embarked, embarked on that as we speak. Um, and we've always been, I mean, from day one, we've always uh, been keen to be part of or to host uh, hackathons and uh, the like. Uh, I think there's a separate discussion on is there uh, enough free data now available in India as it used to be earlier in terms of the trend lines. Uh, I'm not sure it is now. Uh, I think there are a lot of areas where now data, there seems to be a slowing down of data sets uh, and uh, it's clearly not available in, in the areas that you want. There's a lot of data available which you maybe don't want. Uh, but when you start really looking for employment or jobs and so on, I think there are some uh, very valid questions. Also, you know, there, there are a lot of delays in, uh, let's say, uh, census data. Right now we are in 2022, we should be looking at another census. Uh, and the last union budget talked about digitizing this process and you know using this digital kind of delivery to collect data and so on. Uh, nothing has happened as yet, obviously because of the pandemic and so on. But I mean, but what it does mean is that there are some very very critical uh, large data kind of uh, sets which are missing uh, from our discourse uh, as they should be. Uh, so what do you substitute that with? Uh, you know, what are your second and third options? And it's a tough question. It's not easy. I mean, let me give you an example. Uh, when we were trying to respond to this question of uh, toilets that were being built by the government, right? So government was saying, government was saying that we've built 50, 60, 50 million, 60 million, 80 million. I think it went up to 100 million toilets that were built. So now, uh, how do you show that? So we we try to look at data. The data actually was funny because if I remember correctly, the data was showing uh, a level of construction which was almost unimaginable, right? It was showing that we were constructing at X number of toilets a day, which by any stretch of imagination looked uh, very large, but there was no way to uh, counter that. So you had to believe it. I mean, uh, you had to accept that uh, maybe, uh, you know, every state government, every whatever was pumping in money, effort, people, materials to build those toilets. So we went on the ground and we try, we started taking pictures. And that's when we discovered, I think, as many others did, that many of these toilets were not, not really toilets. I mean, they were being used as storage rooms for cement bags or something, something else, or basically not being used as toilets at all. Or even the toilets were not built in the way that they should have been. There was no proper uh, drainage system. Uh, even the basic construction was flawed and so on. So as when we say data journalists, I mean, maybe this goes back to the primary question. I mean, it's data and journalism. I mean, you, we have to con combine the both. Uh, combine these two worlds, right? So what we we use data to build the initial kind of set of arguments or data uh, or uh, or po uh, positions, and then we go on ground and see uh, what's going on, or we do that simultaneously. And that applies to every story we do, by the way. So uh, and and that's how data journalism is really practiced. It's not about just sitting in front of a computer and uh, you know uh, that's one part of it. So. Uh, uh, I think where we can find uh, multiple data sets or uh, cross-referenceable data sets, we should absolutely do that and we do that. Uh, but sometimes you will not find it. And uh, oftentimes you have to back it up with uh, classic journalism as, as we always do, but so should others. 
But I think to your larger question of can everyone do it, I doubt. I mean, I don't think people have even time for the primary set of data that I talked about. I mean, forget everything else. So uh, I think the, the only option is to say, can we create a culture of asking questions? You know, if people ask questions, uh, then at least hopefully you will get some answers. And at least that means you're, uh, you know, there is some critical thinking involved in before you form your decision, whether it's about voting for someone or about, or forming a conclusion about what someone has done for you or not done. I mean, an elected representative, since we are talking about uh, elections and democracy. In fact, I, uh, I, I, my, the toilet data story is my favorite uh, for understanding and explaining data and, how, and showing how problematic it is because uh, you know, a large number of uh, women actually did not want toilets uh, because that, uh, con that kind of restricted their mobility. The only mobility that a lot of women in North India had was, was, was going out of the home and bringing toilet into their homes meant that they could not step out of their homes. And, you know, the toilet data story initially never obviously wouldn't have looked into this because they were just looking at numbers. So we need classic uh, journalism to, uh, to, to follow it up. Yes, I think the Ruchira's question was for Roshan also. No, uh, so uh, more than one data set always, like I said, you, know, you can, uh, when I gave the agriculture example, you can reach very different conclusions depending on what data you are looking at or not looking at. Uh, as far as the question of a larger engagement and collaboration is concerned, some of that has been happening in India. Uh, I mean, look at the NREGS, for example. You know, uh, when the government started like putting up online master roles and all that, and the entire Jan Sunwai culture, which was built around examining master roles, I think was in a way an organized public effort to question official data. You know, and there were genuine problems which were found to be with. Uh, it, during COVID, a lot mm -hmm. of people got together and we built that public database, which was hosted on a public website. A lot of journalistic coverage actually you know, was possible because of that database, because it would have taken far too many people than what a typical journalism has, uh, newsroom has. Now, and this brings me to the larger question, which Kishle asked Govind earlier also. You know, uh, when there's so much news, this 24-7 news cycle, this mad rush, I mean, uh, can data journalism win this battle? You know, newsrooms are a daily battle. You, you come to the newsroom, you wage a battle every day and you go back. So this no declaring victory, so to say, because newsrooms are institutions. They're not about people. But I think as, you know, this internet takes over the news cycle and, you know, the breaking news part has already been taken out of, you know, I'm talking business of journalism here. So if I am a newspaper or if I am a website, you know, I have to make money to be able to, you know, make, pay my bills, pay my people. Uh, so when you're not in the breaking news cycle anymore, you know, and once in a while there are investigative stories, but you, if you are a, a newspaper or a website, you can't do investigative stories every day. I mean, it's very difficult. Uh, I think there, if you have a dedicated data team, which like Govind said, you know, the basic challenge is not to make graphs or beautiful visualizations. The basic challenge is to ask questions and then seek their empirical validity or lack of it. That I think in today's environment where every newsroom is actually trying to go behind a paywall, you know, try and compete with a Facebook or a Google in you know, garnering as much of the digital revenue as possible. And that is only possible if you have some exclusive content. There, I think data journalism and this entire approach of a data-driven thing, especially in the polarized times we live in India today, you know, where everything you say basically has you know, an opposing view, depending on your political persuasion, uh, is a useful thing to have uh, uh, for newsrooms. Thanks so much. Uh, Samyukta? I'm guessing Samyukta uh, is one of our students, right, Samyukta? Uh, yes, Professor. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, sir. So yeah. my question is, uh, do you think that data can, uh, you know, change or influence an election uh, more in the Western countries than, than in India? Because, you know, even if... Uh, what I feel is even if you have a lot of data, um, you show right now how much unsafe UP is during um, uh, uh, Adityanath regime. I think uh, something that plays more there is caste politics and religion politics. So I have this question that, I mean, do you think it is more influential in the Western uh, countries where literacy rate is more? Roshan, you want to go first? <laughs> We are not uh, accused the Russians of hacking our elections so far. So that way, you know, uh, you know, I can say this with a lot of confidence. Our election system is far better than the American election system. You know, there they are talking stuff such as voter suppression. These things we have left, I think, in the 1980s. Uh, so literacy or lack of it is 
I mean, ideally, everybody should be literate and educated, but literacy or lack of it, I do not think is a very you know, important sort of you know, bellwether of the health of your democracy. Uh, you know, as far as the question of public discourse is concerned, see, journalism, journalists and newsrooms can only you know, go till a certain extent. You know, we can't dictate terms to the society. If the society thinks that you know, there's value or you know, premium in you know, making political decisions on you know, other bases than what we think are important, then you know, a political process has to engage with that. I mean, you can't, you know, there, there, there was a point of time in this country when you could have you know, invited political backlash for sending women to school. I mean, that still happened in you know, Afghanistan, which is why Malala got a Nobel Prize. So societies evolve over time. I think democratically, we are a very mature society today. Uh, but on the larger question of whether you know, it should be roti kapda and makan and nothing else, I think we'll take it will take a lot more politics to get there. Uh, I mean, we are still a very young democracy, and we're just celebrating the 75th year of the, our democracy. I think uh, you know, uh, in, when when we kind of tried to craft our mission, uh, not that we spend much time doing it, but you know, our objective was to uh, blend data with emotion. Uh, you know, so emotion drives everything. You know, and if one of the things I was in a way uh, influenced by was the Anna Hazare agitations, uh, and what the Anna Hazare agitation showed us was the power of emotion. It could bring people out on the streets. It brought young people out uh, fighting for uh, you know uh, a change in change in the way we live our lives, uh, fighting against corruption, uh, and so on. And uh, one of the things that struck me was uh, as a flip side that uh, if people actually uh, I mean, the Anazare movement, as you know, I mean, in a way it fizzled out because uh, part of it uh, coalesced into Aam Aadmi Party and became the political force uh, and the rest was gone, uh, uh, you know. But the interesting th thing it showed up and, and on the flip side was that that uh, people could actually come out uh, and, and fight for something. Uh, till then, if you were an oldie like me, you were quite, uh, you know, we all thought that uh, this would never happen in India. That never would you have young people coming out, uh, uh, whether connected with social media or otherwise, uh, and uh, you know fighting for a cause. Uh, uh, in this case, being corruption uh, against corruption. So, uh, and and that's what I mean. One of the things that got me thinking at that time was that if all of this could be blended with, let's say, two percent of data or five percent of data, could we have an even more powerful discourse? Uh, could the questions we ask be even more substantive? And that's, I think, really the question that we need to leave ourselves with. I mean, how much of data can influence or will influence, we don't know. I mean, people like us have taken it up as, as a cause and therefore we will continue to do what we're doing. But uh, will it actually influence elections? Uh, can it influence elections? I have no idea. I mean, I have no way of saying that uh, what we've been doing all these years has had any more impact than not. But yes, uh, at a certain level, at a certain section, uh, uh, we definitely yes, we know that. But and you but but you look at the 2016 elections in the United States. I mean, I don't think data had anything to do with uh, uh, the election of Donald Trump, or uh, you know, it had everything to do with uh, disaffection of uh, white voters, misinformation, fake news, uh, technology, and targeting uh, by using uh, you know analytic software like Cambridge Analytica. I mean, all of which had nothing to you know. I mean, I don't know whether what role anything had to do with anything in that. I mean, it was completely another world. So. Um, uh, and people continue to believe uh, so many things, including the fact that the election uh, was stolen uh, right now in the United States, right? And uh, so, uh, so what is the role of all the work that people like us do? I don't know. And and there are people like us in the United States as well, uh, some of whom we've uh, uh, you know looked at as models to emulate. But is that really uh, affecting or changing public discourse? Uh, in some ways, you could argue it's only gone worse in this in this period. And you would be right. Uh, but we have to keep uh, doing what we're doing uh, and hope that, uh, you know, like I said, uh, if we can keep trying to improve the blend of data with emotion, because emotion will always be the stronger, uh, uh, the stronger ruling force, uh, then hopefully uh, we've done our job. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, in my long years of journalism, even if I can count five stories which has had impact, I would be very happy. Uh, but we got to carry on for that long period to get even if one life changes, that's 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 useful. I think uh, Archal Poddar, do you want to come online and ask the question, Archal? Because you've typed it there. Are you there, Archal? I think there's a question in the chat box where she asks, uh, how much has data journalism penetrated in Indian journalism today? Because Indian journalism 
I think what, what she's trying to say is that yeah, since Indian journalism is driven uh, by popular perception and it's demand driven uh, or clickbait, is data journalism follow, does, does it follow a similar uh, model? Roshan probably would be a better place to answer this. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong in journalism being demand driven. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you have to make revenues. Like I said, you know, uh, you know the future of you know, you know, uh, genres such as data journalism lies in the fact that eventually every newsroom will have to offer something exclusive. So think of data journalism as your exclusive feature writing team, you know, you know as your best sports writer and those kind of things. Uh, so that way, you know, it's not rocket science, you know, what I mean. If, if you claim to be a journalist, it basically means that you do work which will be understood by the masses. It's, it's not meant for you know, uh, a small minority of you know, very sort of uh, uh, geek kind of people. So there, I think data journalism has a future. And you know, increasingly, more and more newsrooms, you know, as I can see, you know, are engaging. They, they either have a team or they you know, at least try and engage with data there. I don't think all is lost. It's the, those clickbait things will always be there. But I... I also think that this, you know, I mean, internet has done bad things to the uh, I mean, journalistic profession, but it has also done good things to the profession. I mean, if, I mean, Kisle, when you started your journalistic career, and you know, when I started my journalistic career, the amount of information I have at my disposal in real time, and the amount of convenience it gives me in story writing is immense. I mean, this is all because of the internet. So we have to live with the negative side effects of it, and you know, and like any other profession, you know, try to make the most of what are the positives which this has given us. Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Govin and Roshan and the others. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, we three are journalists, so I think I'm, I'm we can only talk about stories and storytelling and uh, storytelling which can be which which can be made better, more compelling using um, numbers, using visualizations, uh, trying to remove the haze of misinformation as, as as Gobind says and I'm sure there are other people who will tell you who will tell you better about data protection which is which is the other big uh, concern particularly during elections where your phone data gets transformed into electoral data where <coughs> caste religion and even your income gets mapped uh, through your electricity bill I mean you know did we ever imagine that our electricity bill is giving away our entire data to political parties uh, and political campaigners and how e-voting or blockchains or whether that go, that's going to be of any use or whether that's going to have more risks, but those are for uh, others to really uh, comment. We are wrapping this up. Uh, I think Shantal probably will have the, you want to. Uh... Right, uh, just to thank everyone and say, please come for our session on the 22nd, we'll be, talking about electoral bonds, and we'll have Nitin Sethi and Jagdeep Chokar. Okay, and one last thing uh, for the audience that when you go to India Spend or when you read Hindustan Times or any newspaper, anything, please subscribe, please contribute, because if you do not pay, you cannot expect quality information. Uh, so and it costs you less than a cup of coffee in your nearest cafe. So Thank you, please Kishan. go ahead and add that. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Be safe, Thank everyone. everyone. Thank you.